Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. You know, this is the first episode of Blazor Train I produced since .NET 6 shipped in November 2021. So I'm going to revisit some code I wrote in previous episodes and see what happens when I flip them over to .NET 6. From breaking code to new features, it's all coming up right now, right here on... Uh, what's the name of the show again? Oh, yeah. Blaze the Train! Okay, so if you want to use the same materials that I use to learn about .NET 6 and what's new in Blazor, go to .netconf.net and scroll down to this guy right here. Watch session replays. So that'll take you to YouTube and you can see the playlist here in YouTube. And I watch the keynote and then what's new in C-sharp 10, enterprise grade Blazor apps with .NET 6, and then next generation Blazor components with .NET 6. So this combined with just looking around and trying stuff out, I came up with a fix to three projects that I had previously done in Blazor Train. Let me show them to you. So the first one we're gonna talk about is this guy, Blazor Component Lifecycle, because there's some exciting news for WebAssembly developers in that. Next, we're gonna talk about this one, all about files. So this is file uploading, downloading, and storing. And yes, uh, uploading a file in Blazor Server uh, doesn't work with this code in .NET 6. So I'm gonna show you how to fix that. And finally, Blazor Sliders. Blazor Sliders is a component that I wrote for .NET 5. We're going to take advantage of some of the new JavaScript features uh, to make it work with .NET 6. It works with .NET 6 as is, but uh, with these new JavaScript features, it sort of takes away a lot of complexity. So let's talk about the lifecycle stuff. I'm creating a new Blazor WebAssembly standalone app with .NET 5. You see that? Now I'm just going to go to the index page and I'm going to paste in some code that we used in that lifecycle episode. I don't have any markup, so let me just add some here. There you go. Just hello. Now I'm overriding um, some of these virtual methods here in the lifecycle. And the first one is set parameters async. And this is the same code that I talked about in the lifecycle episode. I'm just gonna put a breakpoint here. Now this is WebAssembly. And what do you think's gonna happen? .NET 5. Nothing, absolutely nothing happened. We didn't get those breakpoints. That's because in .NET 5 and before, if you put breakpoints in lifecycle overrides, uh, they don't happen when the page first loads. However, watch this. If I go to counter and then back to home, now we can hook them. All right, but that's not what I want. I want this to work right out of the gate. So let's flip it over to .NET 6. Now here's an easy way to do this if you have a moderately simple project change the target framework from .NET 5.0 to .NET 6.0, just like that. Now, as far as these guys, yeah, you can change them manually if you know the numbers, the latest numbers, but an easy way is just to go to the project, right click and select Manage NuGet Packages, click on Updates, select all the packages that you wanna update, and click update. Okay, and now this is a .NET 6 WebAssembly app. So now let's run it, see what happens. There you go. All of the lifecycle overrides 
are getting called. Of course, they were getting called before, but now the difference is you can set breakpoints. So that was the code in Blazor Component Lifecycle Episode 8. So now let's check out the code from Episode 37, all about files. So I've downloaded the code, and I'm just going to run it as is. This is the .NET 5 version of file uploads in Blazor Server. Now just to show you that it is indeed .NET 5, let's look here in the csproj file, and yes it is .NET 5. This is right off of the Blazor Train website. Now the thing I'm interested in is large files. I have this file earth.png, that is about 30 megs. So I'm going to drop that here in the large file chunked uploader. And you can see the progress going there. It's telling me the percentage here. And it worked. And just to show you, I'm going to open the files folder in File Explorer. And there it is. Looks right. All right, now let's flip this over to .NET 6. And for the moment, I'm going to ignore the Azure storage thing. Now, this is a Blazor server project. There are no package references that I'm going to use that need to get changed from .NET 5 to .NET 6. So we'll just go with that. And let's just run it. And go to Large Files. And try it again. Now, that was very fast. Don't you think? If you look in the files folder now, you can see this guy here. How big is he? Well, he's 30 megs. But it's definitely corrupted. Yeah, sorry. Photos can't open this file because the format is currently unsupported or the file is corrupted. It's the latter. So I struggled with this one. And uh, I found a good reference out there right here in the docs, ASP.NET Core Blazor File Uploads. And I noticed this, the following approach is not recommended because the file stream content is read into a string in memory. Stream reader, browser file open, stream read, read end. This is kind of what I'm doing here. All right, so this is what they recommend using openreadstream.copy2async and then your, your output stream. The problem is you don't get progress in here. Let's just take a look quickly at what I'm doing in the code. So here's the code in question, on large file input change. Right, we have some variables that we're using to disable and enable fields. This one disables the file input field. I get the total bytes. I have a variable percent. I have a chunk size, which I've set to 400,000. It's fairly arbitrary, and I left that comment in there because you can change this. So then I calculate the number of chunks from the total bytes and whatever's left over using the mod operator. So then I get a new file name. I delete it if it exists. I open the input stream. I open the output stream, and I read and write. So I have a buffer. That's the size of the chunk. And then I call read async into that buffer and then write it out to the output stream. This is what isn't working. So I'm going to replace this entire method with some new code. So I've changed this. We still have our uploaded bytes. We still have our uploaded large file and the chunk size and the percent. But notice I don't have any number of chunks and remainder here. That's because, and I'm going to skip down to where we do the read and write, I'm just going to open the output file for writing, and I'm going to open the read stream and copy to async, passing the chunk size as the buffer size to the output stream. But I'm also passing this copy progress info. Now I've added this file called streamextensions.cs, and I have a static class called streamextensions in here, and these are extensions to a stream. I have a copy to and a copy to async, 
Both of these take this progress info, copy progress info, and then I have versions that also have a cancellation token. So there's four things in here. This is the one I'm going to use. Now let's look at copy progress info. Copy progress info has a total bytes. It defines an event called progress. It has a bytes transferred property that has a backing field. And the get just returns that backing field. But the set, after setting the value, raises the progress event. And then there's a percentage, which is a computed read-only property that returns the number of bytes transferred times 100 divided by total bytes. And that'll give us a percentage. So flipping back here, you can see I've created a new copy progress info there. And I'm hooking the progress event with an inline event handler. I set my percent. I set my upload bytes and my large upload message. These are all, these are fields in the UI. And then I call state has changed. Now all I have to do is just say open read stream and copy to async. Now let's give it a shot. Well, that looks like it worked, and it did. Now, I got to give credit to Tour for this. I found stream extensions on uh, Tour's GitHub, and he has a little GitHub gist here. And this adds the stream extensions, including the copy progress info, although his copy progress info is very simple. It just had the bytes transferred. I added the event handler and all of that. Finally, we're going to look at the code for Blazor sliders. So Blazor sliders I did in .NET 5, and this is making split screens with multiple panels and sliding splitters. And I have a repo for this on GitHub. And I basically just cloned the project, and I'm running it here in Visual Studio 2022. Now you can see it is a .NET 5 application. There is the component itself, Blazor Sliders, right? And this is a Razor class library project. And then you have a Blazor Sliders test, which is a Blazor server application that tests the Blazor Sliders, and also a WASM version. So I'm going to set the startup project to Blazor Sliders test. And let's just run it, .NET 5, no sweat ski. And I'll zoom in a little bit. So here you go. I've got a slider, and the slider goes left and right, and it stops at a certain point so you don't go off the screen. Here's a horizontal slider. Here's four panels. Let's make this a .NET 6 application. That's the first thing we'll do. So starting here, I'm just going to change the server application to .NET 6. I'll go to the test WASM. I'll change that to .NET 6. And I'll update the NuGet packages. And I'll go to Blazor Sliders, and we'll make that a .NET 6 application and also update the NuGet packages. All right, so I don't expect any issues here running it just as a .NET 6 application. And there are none. However, Blazor Sliders is a component, right? It's a Razor class library. And I've got my components here, horizontal slider panel with my code behind and a CSS file that's scoped. Very good. Now I have this sliders.js file that has my code in it. And in .NET 5, you have to have an interop class to access your JavaScript. So here is my slider interop. And I have to import the content from Blazor Sliders, sliders.js. 
And then all my methods that I would normally call just with regular JavaScript interop, I have to wrap them up. This is just what needed to be done in .NET 5. And the JS file, all of my functions have to be written as exports. Register window, force resize, register vertical slider panel, etc. In .NET 6, you do not have to do this. You don't have to have all this interop layer. What you can do is simply rename your JavaScript file to the library name, which is blazersliders.lib.module.js. So you can see it's the library name, .lib.module.js. And now I can get rid of slider interop, but I gotta change my code to use this correctly. So just like I would do with, you know, putting a, a script tag in either my underscore hosts file or in my web root index.html for WebAssembly. I'm going to do these the same way. So I'm going to say window dot capital register window equals arguments and then a lambda. And I'm gonna do that for all of these. Now we're not out of the woods because we got rid of that interop thing. So everywhere we're calling it is gonna throw an error. I'm gonna replace my slider interop with just IJS runtime. And we'll go into the code. Now we're gonna get some errors here. Right there. Instead of await JS interop, register horizontal slider panel, we're gonna say, await JS runtime, invoke void async. Name of the method is the first one, and then all of the arguments. So this is what you're used to doing now. And I'm not saying you have to change anything. What I'm saying is, when you build a component, if you name your JavaScript file correctly, you can access it in the the Razor class library, just as you would uh, in a regular Blazor application. All right, so let's do the rest of them. Now we have other issues because we added slider interop as a scoped service to the test programs. So we'll get rid of that. Get rid of it here in program for WebAssembly and try again. Nice. So that's a really nice bit of .NET 6 for you. Now, of course, there's other things that I could show you about .NET 6, and I have started all that stuff, but you'll have to tune in for more Blazor Train. Back to you in the studio, Carl. So this week, I also produced a new episode of the .NET Show, episode 13, which explores new features of the c -sharp language in c -sharp 9 and c -sharp 10. It's all about records and how they compare with classes and structs. Along the way, you'll discover why immutability really drove the design of these new features. Head on over to the .NET Show .com and watch that space for the next couple of weeks where I'll unpack more .NET 6 goodness. Hey, thanks for riding the rails with me today. This is where I jump off. I'll see you next time. Blaze